Hey everyone, so great to be here with you guys. Great to see you this morning. Hey, uh, we are actually starting a brand new series in the book of Jonah. When's the last time that you read or you studied the book of Jonah at church? Anybody recently read or studied the book of Jonah? Nobody. So this is going to be amazing. So Jonah's amazing. It's in the Old Testament. If you're in like Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, just go left. It's in these 12 books called the Minor Prophets. So they're small books. You can kind of like try to figure out where it is or go to the front of your Bible and see the page number. But we're going to do today an overview of Jonah. And then next week, we'll get in Jonah chapter 1. I just have to say, I've been away two weeks. Um, I travel and speak on mental health and suffering in Christianity. And uh, I was down in Southern California doing a series of talks on emotional health and following Jesus. And then I was at Bayside Santa Rosa last weekend um, teaching at another Bayside campus. But I just have to say, every weekend I'm gone, I just want to be here with you guys. Like, this is the best church. And that's a good moment. Like, when you are traveling and you're away at other churches that you love and you appreciate, but really your heart is at your home church. So I just want to say I missed you guys, and I'm so glad to be back with you this weekend. Jonah, overview, who's ready for this? Amen. Jesus, we are so grateful just to be in this place, to be together, to have an opportunity to worship in such a unique time. And I pray that this book, as we open it up and begin to think about it, I pray that this book would truly transform us and give us perspective in the moment that we're living through and also give us an understanding of your heart and your nature and how you relate to humanity god thank you for every single person here today i pray that you would speak uniquely into each heart exactly what you desire and they need in jesus name and all god's people said Amen. When people think of the book of Jonah, they obviously almost always think of a big fish, right? (laughs) Like when you think of Jonah, if you've ever read it or you grew up in the church or maybe you didn't grow up in the church, you're like a big fish. Well, we're going to get into that in a moment. But most people think of a great fish. But I don't want you to think about Jonah like that. I don't want you to think about Jonah as like Jonah getting swallowed in a massive whale shark or whale or whatever. Um, I want you to think about Jonah from three perspectives. First of all, if you want to know about Jonah, you've got to know about Jonah, right? Brilliant. If you want to know about Jonah, you've got to know about Jonah. You're like, who's Jonah Wesley? Jonah is a prophet in ancient Israel. A prophet spoke to people, God's word. A prophet spoke on behalf of God to people, to the nation of Israel, God's chosen people living in the land in the Middle East. And he was a prophet. He was a well-known prophet in Israel. And uh, he was the only prophet during these days to be sent to a foreign nation. So God gave him a unique calling. And in fact, Jonah is referred to by Jesus three times. Jesus discusses the story of Jonah and links it to the most important part of his story. And so Jesus validates the story and person and work of Jonah. And he never speaks of Jonah negatively. Oftentimes in the church, when we title the series of Jonah, or we talk about the book of Jonah, it's always kind of a negative connotation toward Jonah. But here's the thing. Jesus never talked about Jonah negatively. And I love that. I love that because that can relate to our lives. We're like, oh God, we failed or we've resisted or we've walked away from our calling uh, that you called us to. And yet God gives us grace and I'm getting ahead of myself, but I couldn't help it. So you got to think about Jonah. The second thing that you've got to, to think about when you think about the book of Jonah is the city of Nineveh. Nineveh, the, this, the whole story is about a prophet going to a city and When we think of the book of Jonah, understanding the city of Nineveh is so vital. Uh, Nineveh was a capital or an important city in the Assyrian Empire. Uh, If you've studied history, that was one of the major world empires in human history. Uh, It's located in modern day northern Iraq. And so it was a major city uh, by the Tigris River. 
the city was populated by like 600,000 people. And if you study ancient history, 600,000 people in a city was massive in ancient times. So Jonah was called to this city. But here's the thing about this city. Nineveh and the Assyrians were enemies of Israel. This is where Jonah lived. This was Jonah's people. They were a threat to Israel. In fact, they were known in their time as the cruelest, most wicked, evil military in their time at that point in history. So when Jonah gets called to this city, I can't even tell you the things that they did to their victims right now because there's kids here. Like It is so brutal and bad. If you understood how bad the Ninevites and the Assyrians treated the captives of war, you would understand why Jonah was so hesitant to go to the city. Now, if you want more information about this, just because this setting is probably not the appropriate time to talk about some of this stuff, um, send me an email. I'll send you a whole little blurb on, on how bad this was. Wesley.towne at baysideonline.com if you can get that that fast. Wesley.town at baysideonline.com. Third, the third thing you need to know about if you're going to study the story of Jonah is God's redemptive heart. Jonah, a prophet, called to a city, Nineveh, one of the leading cities in the Assyrian Empire, a cruel, wicked uh, nation that had all kinds of brutal war atrocities. And yet we find a God with a redemptive heart calling Jonah to go to the city and to proclaim a message so that they could turn away from the life they were living and turn to God. It's a beautiful story. In fact, God is the main character of this story. It's not Jonah. God is mentioned 38 times in 58 verses. That's the entire book. 58 verses, God is mentioned 38 times. This book is all about God's redemptive heart. And I think that's so important in a day like we're living in with so much division and unrest and questions about people and society and culture and social circles and groups and opinions and so on and so forth to get us back to focusing on God's redemptive heart for all people. Like, that's a good word, right? Like, we need that here and now in this moment that we're living for to be reminded that God is a God who has a redemptive heart for every person, even the nation, even the empire of Assyria, even the city of Nineveh. Now, we wanted to make this practical as well. But I want to give you kind of an overview real quick of four chapters. And then we're going to ask a question about each of these chapters based on kind of the content within it. So chapter one, if you're a note taker, write this down. If you're not a note taker, write it down anyways. Chapter one, Jonah chapter one is about Jonah in a ship. Jonah in a ship and he's protesting. So Chapter one is about Jonah. He, he's got this call. He runs away from God. He's protesting, but he's in a ship. Jonah chapter two is about Jonah in some sort of fish, whale shark or whatever. He got swallowed up. It's actually, uh, there's been other cases like this attributed in ancient history. Um, so Jonah's in a fish and he's praying. Chapter one, Jonah in a ship protesting. Chapter two, Jonah in a fish praying. And then chapter three, Jonah's in the city. So he goes from a ship to a fish to the city of Nineveh and he's preaching. He's preaching a message to turn the people away from what they're doing, how they're living and back to God. And then in Jonah chapter four, Jonah, some people would say this, Jonah's in the suburbs and he's pouting. So chapter one, Jonah in the ship protesting. Chapter two, Jonah in the fish praying. Chapter three, Jonah in the city preaching. And then chapter four, he goes to the east of the city and he's in the suburbs and he's pouting. You're like, I want to know more about all of that. Well, hang out with us for the next five weeks and you'll get to know each chapter. But here's the thing, to make this uh, practical, we've taken from each chapter one major theme and question. And these are questions to ask ourselves from the first four chapters of Jonah 
that really are so vital in the time that we're living through. So I've got more for you to write down. The first question from Jonah 1 is this, God is sovereign, will I surrender? That's what Jonah chapter one's about. Jonah's this prophet of God. He was called to speak the word to ancient Israel. One day God calls him, he says, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and I want you to give them a chance to be redeemed and forgiven and have a new way of life and be in a relationship with me. And Jonah hears this call and he says, no way, God, no way am I going to do that. Like I'm peacing out. I'm running as far away from where you call me to do this as far away from Nineveh as possible. I am heading the other way. And some would be like, why would he do that? First of all, he's risking his life to go to this enemy of Israel, to go to a place that was known to be the cruelest uh, military on earth, war atrocities like I can't even say publicly right now. He was risking his life if he were to go to Nineveh. Not only that, he was hesitant because, because of their violence, their terror, their cruelty, uh, to the people of Israel, to the nations around them. And he had this idea of justice, like, God, why are we giving them a second chance? They should have this kind of justice where their crimes, their violence, their cruelty has some sort of punishment. We call this uh, uh, retru retributive justice in the Bible. But here's the thing. God was showing Jonah another side of justice. Not just retribution for a crime, for evil, for wickedness, but restorative justice, the heart of God, drawing people back to himself, giving them a second chance. So Jonah's here, and in, in chapter one, God's like, hey, I want you to do this. Jonah's like, peace out, God. He runs, he goes on a ship as far away as possible. A big storm comes, they're like, who, everybody in the ship's like, what happened? We, we don't have storms right now. Like, did somebody do something wrong? And finally, Jonah realizes it was him. He jumps overboard. He gets swallowed by like a whale shark or a big whale. And he's inside the belly of this huge, giant fish, chapter one. I was thinking about this and I thought, God had a heart to forgive and to redeem the Ninevites. And Jonah had a heart for God. Listen to this. Think about this in your own life right now. But not for the people of Nineveh. God's like, I, I love these people. I want to give them another chance. Jonah's like, I love you, God, but I don't love these people. Sometimes that's us, right? We're like, that's the other side. That's my enemy. Those are the people I disagree with. Those are the people that I have a different opinion about how to live and how to treat people, and whatever. And yet God looked at those people and said, I want to give them another chance too. I want to redeem them as well. See, Jonah had a heart for God, but not for this particular group of people. But God was showing Jonah, I have a heart for all people and I want you to have a heart for all people too. This is the way of Jesus. Didn't Jesus teach us to love not just one another, but to love our enemies. Matthew chapter five, verse 44 says, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. When's the last time that you and I loved our enemies and prayed for the people that persecuted us? Like this isn't easy, is it? Like think of the people that have persecuted you, said evil things against you, maligned you, talked negative about you, and you, say, Jesus, I can't do this on my own. I can't love these people on my own. I, I, this isn't in my heart, but this is in your heart. So I need you to give me your heart so that I can love these people and pray for these people, even though they're not in my squad. In fact, they're my enemies. Another viewpoint to this, is, which is interesting. Jonah is always kind of painted as this like, rebellious prophet who ran from God. But if you're to study the Old Testament, 
and you're to study calls that God has on people's life, there's a pattern that you see in the Old Testament. It's this pattern. God calls, somebody resists, then God calls again. Does that feel like our lives, right? God calls, somebody resists, and God calls again. This happened with Abraham, Sarah, Moses, Jeremiah, Jonah, even Peter uh, experienced this. In fact, Jeremiah, he resisted God's call. He was struggling with God's call. And he said in Jeremiah chapter 20, verses 7 through 9, listen to this. He said, God, you deceived me, and I was deceived. You overpowered me and prevailed. I am ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. Whenever I speak, I cry out proclaiming violence and destruction. So the word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. But if I say, I'm not going to mention your word anymore, God. I'm not going to speak anymore in your name. Jonah says this, his word is in my heart like fire. A fire shut up in my bones. I'm weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. So God calls him. He's struggling. He's resisting. He says, everybody is speaking evil against me. Everybody's opposing me. And he says, God, some days I just want to stop this call. I don't want to talk about you anymore. I don't want to proclaim you anymore. I don't want to speak these words. You're telling me to speak to the people. And then he says, but I can't do it. Your word is burning in my heart. I feel this call on my life, and I'm so weary resisting it. I think this is so important because I thought, how many of us have done that? How many of us, maybe sitting right here right now, have resisted God's call or in the middle of resisting God's call? God calls, we're resisting, we're struggling with it, but God's going to give us a second chance. I remember... When I was a teenager, uh, and I was at my high school, and I started this Bible study, and I felt like I, I walked out of this math study area, and I felt like God said to me, Wesley, I want you to be a pastor. And I'm like, no way, God. Like, that is not my plan. I'm an athlete. I want to be a doctor or a lawyer or anything else but a pastor. And I felt that resistance in my humanity. I felt like, you know, like this isn't my plan. This isn't what I want to do with my life. And I felt that same thing when I was in uh, my mid-20s living in Hawaii. Yes, Hawaii, love it. Um, Living in Hawaii and uh, on the island of Maui, uh, teaching and leading a Bible college. and, uh, And I felt like this call, like, hey, hey, Wesley, I want you to move back to Oregon. Hawaii, Oregon, sunny, rainy beautiful island uh you know pretty trees but still dark and rainy i want you to move back to oregon and i was like we got there and i was like no god i'll move down to southern california i'll I'll move down to santa cruz where the ocean is like anywhere but oregon so i resisted and then i did it and we started a church and within three years there was more than a couple thousand people at our Easter Sunday. And I look back and I'm like, oh God, like I totally didn't want to do that. I was resisting you, but I'm so glad that when you gave me that second call, I said, yes, God. I just wonder if there's some people here today that God is calling you to do something. God has a plan for your life. God wants to use who you are, what you're good at, your experience to make a difference in this world. And you felt that, to follow Jesus, to live your life for Jesus, to do something for Jesus in this world. And I'm wondering if God would be saying today to you and to me, will you surrender? Will you surrender to that call? Will you surrender to knowing that I have a good plan for your life? Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for you to prosper and not to harm you. To give you a hope and a future. It's never worth writing from God's call. It's hard. We're human. We resist. But God is calling us to surrender today. Second question. This is chapter 2. And I'll, I'll, I'll speed up the pace now. Jonah chapter 2. God is personal, will I pray? So in Jonah chapter 2, God 
uh, here's Jonah, he's in this fish, and uh, we'll talk about this later on. And he realizes, whoa, what have I done? And he begins to cry out to God for mercy, for forgiveness. He's reflecting on what God had called him to do and his resistance and the injustice of Nineveh. And he cries out to God. And guess what God does? From inside the belly of the fish, God answers his prayer. Because God's a personal God. Even when we resist, even when we wander, even when we struggle, God is a personal God. Even when we run the opposite of God's call in our life, God is still present and God is pursuing us. You can't outrun God. Jonah tried it. It's not possible. God's omnipresent and God is personal and he personally cared about Jonah and he personally cared about Nineveh and both and would get a second chance. Like you might be sitting here and you have all these emotions because you're like, Man, if I follow God's call, if I begin to follow Jesus, like I've messed up too much, I've partied too much, I've done too much wrong, I, I have all these things that I, that I feel emotionally guilt and shame, and God would speak right into that narrative you are thinking through mentally and emotionally and say, you're forgiven. I'm not a God who holds guilt and shame over your thinking over your emotions you are forgiven and set free you cannot outrun God and God invites you into his goodness into his personal nature to walk with him and live for him and follow his call on your life remember the old testament story of Adam and Eve they were in this garden. God had created this beautiful world. There was no sin. Everything was just as God intended it. And they decided to do what God said not to do. After that, they felt a sense of shame and guilt. So they made a covering to cover themselves because human beings always try to cover themselves up when they feel shame and guilt. We hide. We wall up. We distant from God. We distant from people. And guess what God did? God pursued them. God is pursuing you today. God is pursuing us. God is never going to give up on you. God wants you to come to Jesus, you to follow Jesus, you to listen to Jesus' call on your life today, just as he did for Jonah. I wrote this down. God would rather allow uncomfortable circumstances to turn our lives back to him than comfortable circumstances that would allow us to still run away from him. This was an uncomfortable circumstance for Jonah. But I love Jesus. This is how Jesus views people. Jonah runs. Jonah flees. Jonah doesn't do what God called him to do. God gives him a second chance. And Jesus likens Jonah's story to the most important part of his story. Which shows me that with God, there's always hope and there's always resurrection. Listen to this, Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, this is Jesus, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. In other words, Jesus says, I'm going to liken Jonah's story to my death and my resurrection. God is a God of second chances. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Jonah chapter 3. We're almost done. Jonah chapter 3. God is restless. Relentless, pardon me, not restless. You're like, wait a minute, Wesley. God is relentless. Will I repent? So in Jonah chapter 3, Jonah obeys God. He goes to Nineveh. He preaches. The people repent. It's an amazing story. The people of Nineveh, this cruel, wicked, evil nation, they turn from their wickedness and they turn to God. Because God is a God of second chances. Maybe you feel like Jonah did it and you're like, I've run from God's call. God would say, today's the day to turn to me. Maybe you feel like Nineveh and you're like, I've just done so much evil and bad stuff in my life and surely God would never love me or forgive me. And God would say to you, yes, I do love you and I want to forgive you. 
And that's why Jesus Christ came to this world. That's why Jesus Christ went to the cross to die upon it, to forgive all of our sins, to reconnect us with the living God so we could be in a relationship with him forever and ever. And then he died and he rose again in victory over sin, death, darkness, Satan. He wants to give you a second chance today. Turn to Jesus. In chapter three, I I want you to, Uh, to notice in chapter 3 there's this key term in chapter 3 and it's in chapter 3 verse 10 if you want to turn with me there and here it is chapter 3 verse 10 when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened there was justice but there's also forgiveness There was justice potentially, but God gave them a second chance. And they turned to God, and notice that term, turned. It's the key term in the book of Jonah. It comes from a Hebrew term, shuv. Now you know Hebrew, shuv. Shuv means to turn away from and to return. It's like, I'm going this way. Like, I'm going my own way. I'm doing my own thing. I'm doing the Wesley Town thing apart from God, living my own life, doing my own thing. And then I realize one day, wait a minute. This isn't the life that I want to live. My soul is so restless and there's a lack of peace and joy and I feel guilty and shame. And there's all these narratives in my soul that are unhealthy that I don't like the way that I'm living anymore. And we say, God, I want to turn away from that. But we just don't turn away, we return back to God. We don't just return away from what we were doing wrong. We return to the God who created us, the God who sent his son to save us. We say, God, I'm turning away from that life and I'm turning back to you. I'm turning back to you because you're a God of care. You're a God of compassion. You're a God of redemption. You're a God who has concern for my life And I'm realizing that my life apart from you is not the life I want to live any longer. I love how Jesus talked about this too. In Luke chapter 11, verse 32, Jesus said, the men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. The generation Jesus was talking to because they wouldn't believe in him. They wouldn't turn. They wouldn't turn back to him. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah And now someone greater than Jonah is here. Someone greater. Jesus speaking hope, forgiveness, life, redemption into your story, into your narrative, into what you're going through, into what you're experiencing and feeling right now in this moment. Jesus is speaking in to your life. And then number four. Number four. God is gracious, will I grow? Chapter four, so they, turn, they return to God. God loves them, God loves you. We all need to return to God. And then in chapter four, Jonah goes outside of the city, goes to the east of the city, and he reflects on God's nature in chapter four. I want you to see this, chapter four, verse two. He reflects on God's nature and he becomes angry. Because he's like, God, how could you forgive these people? There are enemies. Look at all that they've done wrong. I don't like these people. There's prejudice in my heart toward them. How could you do this, God? And he is angry. In fact, Jonah chapter 4 verse 1 says, But Jonah, see, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, and he said this, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you were gracious, underline that, and a compassionate God, underline that, slow to anger, underline that, and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. This is God. This is God's nature. God is gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in love in love grace God giving you what you don't deserve compassionate understanding your struggle and the things that you're going through and and, and entering into that he's slow to anger he's not not quick to judge 
like we are sometimes, quick to get angry or heated in the moment. God's not like that. He is patient with all of us. That's a beautiful thing. And he's abounding in love. The idea here, abounding in love, comes from a Hebrew term, kesed, which means he is loyal and faithful in love towards you. He's loyal, he's loyal and faithful in love. On the day that you feel like Jonah and you've walked away, God is faithful and loyal. On the day that you feel like Nineveh, uh, just I've done too much wrong in my life. I, I, I can't believe that God would give me another chance to turn to him. On that day, God is loyal and faithful to love you in the person of Jesus. Today is the day to respond to the grace of God. Are you with me? You see, grace, grace, God extends. That's his action. We then respond to that grace. You're like, Wesley, Wesley, how, how do I respond to the grace of God? And I'm so glad you asked me today. Here's how you respond to the grace of God. You receive it. You believe it's for you. It's for your story, it's for your narrative, it's for what's happening inside of you, it's for what you've done in your life. Grace is for you, you receive it, you believe it, and the Bible teaches us that grace teaches us so that we have to learn from it. We're like, okay God, I've received your grace, I'm gonna live different now. I'm gonna grow, I I'm gonna change, I'm gonna allow your grace to be the catalyst to make my life like Jesus. In other words, when we receive and believe the grace of God for our life, we live differently. Jonah was struggling with this. Jonah was resistant to the grace of God in other people's lives, and so he was angry, and God's like, that's not how you respond to my grace. But Jonah knew the nature of God. He just didn't want to respond accordingly. Today's the day to respond to the grace of God, to say, God, I want to follow the way of Jesus now. I, I, I want to receive it, believe it, learn from it, grow in it. I want to follow the way of Jesus. And then I want to go another step. I want to do what Jonah was resisting. I want to extend your grace to the people around me. I believe it. I receive it. I learn from it. I grow in it. And I extend it to the people like the Ninevites. And, and the question for us today is like, who is like the Ninevites in our life? That we don't think God can save, that we don't think God can give a second chance, that we don't love, that in our hearts we're angry. If God would ever redeem their life, God would say, I want you to not just receive my grace, I want you to extend my grace to those people. This is the way of Jesus. It's countercultural. It's different. It's not like anything else we see in our society, but it is the way of Jesus, and it's the way in which he has called us and taught us to live, to extend his grace to other people. I can't think of a better way to end the Sunday sermon in this week than to say in a moment of so much cultural unrest, to say, God, I wanna have your heart right now. Because this moment is really challenging on so many levels, from so many different vantage points and perspectives. I wanna have your heart, and I wanna extend your grace to the other side. God, you, you can save me, you can save anyone. God, you give me a second chance, you can give anyone a second chance. God, there's people in my life that I don't like, but I want your heart to love them and to extend the same redemptive grace to them that you've extended to me. May we follow the way of Jesus more than the way of culture in this moment. Amen. Amen. Jesus, I just pray. I pray for this message to resonate deeply inside of us. 
that we would look to the King, Jesus, and His kingdom in this moment and say, Jesus, we want your heart. We want your will to be done. We want your kingdom to come. And we want to reflect that as you teach us in the Lord's Prayer, on earth as it is in heaven. So in this moment of unrest, may we be a people of hope. May we be a people of love. May we be a people of grace. May we be a people of redemption. And may we be a people that find rest in our souls in our relationship with you. God, touch every heart here today. If you are here today and you say, I've been like Jonah, I know Jesus, but God has had a call on my life and I've walked away, I've wandered off. Everybody with your hands, I mean your heads bowed and your eyes closed. If that's you today, would you just raise your hand? No shame at all. Just put your hand in the air in boldness and say, God, I want to get back to following you and your good plan for my life today. God bless you. Maybe you're here and you don't know Jesus. And today Jesus is inviting you into relationship with him. To believe him, that he is your savior, your Lord, your king, the son of God. To believe that he died on the cross and rose again to forgive you of all shame and all guilt and all wandering and all sin. And to invite you into his rest into a relationship with the living God for all of eternity. Raise your hand right now. And both of you, any of you who put your hands up, would you pray this prayer to, with me, just silently? Jesus, I want to follow your plan for my life. I want to live within your calling, hopeful, future, that you have planned for my life. And Jesus, I proclaim today that I believe in you as the Son of God, that you left heaven to come to this earth, that you died upon a cross after living a perfect life, and that you showed us the way to live, and then you died a death to enable us to live that life. You did that to forgive me. You did that to invite me into your way, into a relationship with you so that I could be with you and in a relationship with you forever and ever and ever and see my life differently. I believe that today. I receive you, Jesus, in your name. And everyone said, amen. Here's what I want to do as we close. I want us to reflect because I think God is speaking to some of us today. And I think what he's speaking is so important and vital in this moment. So just sit down. We're going to sing another song. But as we're singing, and you, if God is really speaking to you, he's inviting you to follow his call. He's inviting you to, to believe in him and follow him and to respond and to reflect him in our day and this moment. I want you to just talk to him. I want you to worship out of what he's speaking to you. So let's worship and listen to the voice of God in this moment. Oh uh -huh. 
firm foundation that we get to build our lives on. It is that love that Wesley was talking about, that relentless love that Jesus has for us. He's chasing after you just like he was relentlessly loving Jonah in the process of what Jonah was going through. May this be an encouraging word for you today that it was for me. Thank you, Pastor Wesley, for doing that. And I think Nathan has something to share with us as we finish things off here today. That was amazing, guys. Thank you so much for doing worship. And uh, Heidi killed it, as always. And you guys, this is Jackson. This is his first time out here. Can you guys give it up for Jackson? Yes. And here at Bayside, we believe in loving on kids and loving on our community. And one way we do that is by loving on families who have creative kids. So this Sunday, we invited... Ooh, uh, all right, the sign is fine if you guys are wondering. Just, just saying. Uh, this Sunday, we invited the kids to come out and dress up. And I actually only see one kid dressed up. So I'm excited that they get, this entire family gets a gingerbread turkey trot. So it kind of looks like you just dress up some gingerbread turkeys, I guess. But uh, Liam, you dress up. Do you want to run up here and grab this? Also, the thing I love about your costume is your mask is Baby Yoda, right? Oh my goodness, that's amazing. Enjoy this. So, <laughs> that's amazing. Everybody, thank you guys for coming out. Real quick though, Ryan, June, Boaz, can you guys stand up for me? So, Man, they don't even know what they're clapping for. This is great. All I had to do was tell you guys to stand up and everybody started clapping. But first, I want to say thank you to June. June made all the coffee and the cider for us today. So give it up to June. College students or anybody who is 18 to 25, all those little cards that I showed you guys earlier, they have them right now. So please head on over, grab three, give two to your friend, keep one for yourself so you don't forget where to go on Wednesday. Love you guys. Woo.